Good afternoon, and welcome to today's event, to our um, Doctrine and Diversity Speakers Series event on making mistakes. My name is Gregory Bowman, he, him, his, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Dean of Roger Williams University School of Law. Uh, and I'm very pleased to make some introductory remarks at today's program, uh, which is a very important. I'll turn the program over in a moment uh, to my colleague at Roger Williams University School of Law, Mr. But before I do that, uh, I would like to read uh, our land and labor acknowledgement to begin this program. I want to take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places, physically and remotely, and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial, and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and our kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so we acknowledge and honor the Narragansett and the Poconocet people and Soams, the original name of the land that our campus resides on. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it were not for the free enslaved labor of black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol and the very land our campus resides on have benefited significantly from the trade of enslaved people from Africa. The economy of New England, Rhode Island, and more specifically of Bristol was built from wealth generated through the triangle trade of human lives. And during this time of ongoing national reckoning with our history of slavery, and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and the black lives and knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. And while the movement for justice and liberation is building and we are witnessing the power of the people, many are still being met with violence and even being killed. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students who soon will be practitioners of law can be and already are agents of change as well. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this practice of reading a land and labor acknowledgement, why do we do this? I want to share with you a statement from Northwestern University's Native American and Indigenous Initiatives, which explains it much better than I could. And I quote, it is important to understand the longstanding history, history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgements and labor acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or an historical context. Colonialism is a current and ongoing process, and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. So thank you again for being here. I really look forward to today's program. We have an excellent slate of speakers and commentators lined up. And with that, I am very pleased uh, to turn it over to my colleague uh, at Roger Williams University School of Law, Nicole Dzislewski. Nicole? Thank you, Norman. Thank you all for being here today to kick off our second year of the Integrating Doctrine and Diversity Speaker Series. Um, thank you especially to the team at Roger Williams that makes these events happen. Um, and thank you to this year's co-sponsors, CUNY Law, Jurist, Berkeley Law, and George Washington Law. The good news is that we are busy editing the second volume of Integrating Doctrine and Diversity, which is specifically focused on upper level classes. The bad news is that we were in the middle of editing the second volume of Integrating Doctrine and Diversity, and Genevieve Tung is beset on all sides with correcting all of our citation mistakes. Um, our conversation today is a follow-up to one of our events last year about what to do when you, as a law teacher, make a mistake. Um, it was wildly popular, and we got far more questions than we could answer. Um, so we are starting today by trying to answer some of the questions we never got to last time. We're also taking some questions um, in the Q&A or in the chat, whichever way you feel comfortable that we'll try to answer throughout. Um, mistakes happen. 
mistakes happen, especially in this area, because we're pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones, because we're challenging ourselves to teach diversity skills and to integrate DEIB content into our classes. Mistakes happen because we're tired. Um, we have a diversity of students who don't have the same experiences and identities that we have. Um, mistakes happen because we have biases, many of which we're not aware of. Mistakes happen because despite our passion for teaching and our passion for the subject matter we're teaching, we make mistakes. Mistakes happen because we are human. Um, today, we're gonna discuss common mistakes and talk a little bit about how to meaningfully handle them in and after class. Today's panelists come from different places and have different backgrounds, but they all have some experience making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. The panelists generally also have expertise in law school, in the law school DEIB space and have some practical advice to share with everyone. My hope is we can learn from each other and that you at home feel comfortable asking for advice and listening to our panelists. Please feel free to chat in questions and I'll try to ask them where I can. I've already seen one come in, which I'm excited about. Um, so today, I'm gonna start today with Dylan. Dylan is the Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development and Professor of Law at Charleston School of Law. The newest edition of his casebook with Robin Paul Malloy is now available, Land Use and Zoning Law, Planning for Accessible Communities, which focuses on accessibility issues in a variety of contexts and how the law can be can be used to break down those barriers. Dylan, I'm gonna start with you because you were a panelist on the first version of this session um, and, and you survived. Um, in that session, you stated, when you make comments in class, they are not only being delivered by you, but they are being received by an entire audience of students. And so there might be students who receive the information in ways that are not necessarily how you intended it, but really, but it really is offensive or they took it negatively. I think about this a lot when I'm teaching and how my identity informs um, how my comments are stated, how they're formulated and also how they're received. Um, can you talk a bit about what advice you might have to professors who make a comment they believe to be innocent or well-intentioned but is received negatively by students? Um, sure, thank you, Nicole. And thank you for that warm introduction. I, um, I think that that's true. I, sometimes I lose sight of the fact that we're not just teaching, but we're, we're teaching uh, the student, right? So it's not just the law that we have to get across. We have to make sure that we're getting the law across to the student. And um, every now and then the student might receive the information we're trying to convey in a way that is different than intended. And so when those mistakes happen, um, my best advice is to use it as an opportunity to open discussion about why that information was maybe misunderstood or miscommunicated between the professor and the student. Um, as a professor, I try to show a, a sincere willingness to learn from the student as well. I think that there's uh, more buy-in in what I'm trying to teach the students when um, I show a willingness to learn from them. I think students in this in my classrooms today, not only expect us to acknowledge that they know things, but to also expect us to build on the things that they know already. And so being open to the idea that you can use the moment as an opportunity to communicate with your students, maybe learn a little bit more about um, the societal context of what you're trying to say, the maybe teach some of the other students some cultural competency. The key though, is that it needs to come across sincere. Um, it's not just checking a box. I think you build a little bit of that goodwill with your students if you, right from the start, have already built the kinds of relationships where the students know what kind of professor you are and that you're you know, really passionate about what you do and that you're on team student for them to learn. Um, but when these mistakes happen, you can use it as an opportunity to listen to them and learn from them. Uh, they might feel much better about it if they're given the opportunity to speak and be heard on their impressions. Um, it, it's hard to not be defensive in those moments. It's maybe hard to not be obstinate in your approach to teaching the material. But I do think that it's our job to 
figure out how best to reach the student because we do need to realize that it's that we're teaching the law to the student. So um, specifically ways in which you can do that is maybe as the student is expressing their concerns, you can repeat the words so that others in the class can hear what the student is saying so that you can make sure that their voice is heard from everyone. It also shows them that you were listening because you're repeating what they're saying to you. And um, yeah, take it from there where you're maybe using it as an opportunity to, to learn. Thanks, Dylan. Um, I am going to turn to Ralph and Carmia with this next question. Ralph Tavares is the Managing Associate Equity and Inclusive Excellence at Storbeck Search. Previously, he was a DEIB administrator here at Roger Williams Law and was foundational to the start of us having the series in the first place. So a shout out to Ralph. Um, Carmia is the Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at George Washington University Law School. Ralph and Carmia, in whichever uh, order you choose, both of you have had experiences counseling professors and students in different institutions and situations where a student is impacted or offended by comments that a professor has made in a way which they did not intend to hurt or offend, but did in fact hurt or offend. Can you both talk a bit about your experiences and share what advice you have given to professors in this situation? Sure, um, I'll start. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I've been at two large PWIs. I've been at a small HBCU law school. Um, and so I let those experiences inform how I responded or thought about, thought about this topic. And what was really interesting when I went back and looked at the webinars from last year is that everything that I felt and thought it is echoed and has already been said. And, and underscoring all of that is that all advice that I can give is that you already know, right? Speaking to faculty, you already know the answer. If you offend someone, say something. For the love of all things holy, say something, right? If we step on someone's foot, we say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Um, in a classroom, are you okay? Could be a step too far, right? Because all any student wants to do in a, in, a, in, a, in a setting where they feel uncomfortable, not any student, but ma many times they want to disappear. So I think the quick acknowledgement, I think back, uh, as, as Frank said last year, just apologize, back away and apologize again. Um, there is always time after class. Whatever happens in class will exist in Zoom chats, will exist in all of the group chats, will have a life all of its own. So the most that as you can do as an instructor is acknowledge that you have messed up. And in so doing, you are modeling how to manage a mistake. You are modeling that we as perfect, well, a, a mistake in a professional setting. We are modeling for students that how to, how to be uncomfortable, right? Because often these mistakes are around uncomfortable topics. And we are also modeling that relationships survive the uncomfortable conversation, right? So the first thing that Dylan uh, spoke about just now was relationships, right? The climate that we build when we are in a classroom, the relationships that we develop will be the things that buttress us in these difficult conversations. And just to amplify what you said, I agree with everyone. It's the idea of a relationship. Let's not run away from that. Let's run towards it. Um, I think that that's going to help us when things go wrong. I think it's going to make learning more meaningful when things go right. I do think like leaning into the relationship can be really important. Ralph? Yes, and nice to see you, Nicole, and nice to see so many familiar faces in the chat um, and on the panel participant list. So I, I guess sort of a, an umbrella way of that I have approached this is at, at the law school and several other colleges and universities that I've worked at is to try and get professors and students to center empathy as much as possible, which sounds easy, but isn't as easy as you would think. 
um, there was a situation I dealt with, past tense, where a student had been misnamed in the classroom multiple times by a white professor. I'm, I'm just going to give an example. To the point where the misnaming almost became a joke amongst the other students and the student that was being misnamed was incredibly embarrassed, incredibly angry, and was asking like, how can this professor continue to call me the wrong name? And from the lens of the professor, a lot of things were shared. The, the professor said, I have a student chart. I make sure I call in the same students and the student moved their seat. Another thing was I, the student changed their hairstyle. The student, then they said, you know, I have a cognitive challenge with re remembering names specifically. And all these things were true and they were authentic to that professor. And this professor's intentions were not malicious. In fact, th this particular professor is one of the kindest people I had ever met in my professional career. And not but, the impact on this young woman of color was profound. The student talked about what it felt like to have the magnifying glass on them for the remainder of the semester by other students and after naming it to the professor by the professor. The student had spoken up about it in class at one point if, and I'm trying to remember correctly, but it caused the magnifying glass to be cast on them even more. And as the weeks go on, it became this thing. And they were nervous before every single class. Like, who's going to say it? Am I going to be called the same name? Heightened anxiety, lack of focus. Other students were chittering about them, and it became this sort of running joke. The student, the impact on that student is that they felt invisible because they were misnamed. And at the dissonance, they also felt like they were the subject of hyper focus. So it was like this weird duality. By the end of the semester, the student had reflected that they didn't learn anything in the class because they were so focused on the harm that was caused. And this was a clear example of impact versus intention. The harm was not intentional, but impactful nevertheless. So how did we deal with it? Um, I ended up calling upon the student and asked I put the, the student in the position of power and asked how they wanted to handle this and how I could be of service. And they agreed to meet with the professor to have a conversation about it. And it almost was set up like a mediation. I tried again to center empathy and put myself in the shoes of the student. If we're student center, you center the student. And if the student felt invisible, disrespected, unheard, I, I tried to model this sort of conversation with them in a way that made them feel feel heard and seen and respected. And I ended up asking each of them these three prompts. And if Dean Lolly's on, uh, on the call somewhere, Dean Lolly was here with me um, and asked the student and this professor to answer these three questions. What I heard you say is blank. What I didn't hear you say is blank. What I need you to hear is blank. And we did three rounds of that where I had the student share out and the professor listen. And then I had the professor share out and the student listened. And then we did it again. And after the two rounds with each person, the hope was that the student heard and felt seen and respected and was able to share what the impact was of what the professor had done. Um, was it perfect? No. But were they able to move forward from that point? I'd like to think so. So again, it's, it, it was a lot to prepare for it and get into that space. But I, again, we just centered humanity, center empathy as much as you can um, for both parties. Thanks, Ralph. I'm gonna bring Natalie into the conversation. Um, Natalie M. Chin is an associate professor of law at the City University of New York, where she teaches classes in admin law and disability rights and justice. She's also the co-director of the Disability and Aging Justice Clinic. I want to shift the focus a bit to language specifically. Um, Natalie, specifically in your role as co-director of the clinic, which represents low-income New Yorkers in a range of issues, including prisoners' rights, securing due process protections in areas that include sexual rights, alternatives to guardianship, and prisoner rights, and disability-based discrimination under state, local, and federal law. Your area of work seems fraught for professors and students making mistakes about using the correct terminology of conditions, disorders, and, and identities. Do you counsel students to use people first language? Um, has there been a time when you or someone in the clinic made a mistake? And can you talk a bit about how you approach a situation 
where someone, a professor, a student, a client, has used an incorrect, outdated, and or offensive term in reference to work at your clinic or in the classroom. Wow, sure. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, so those are all really wonderful questions. I think with language, I think it's really helpful for students. So when I teach the class to understand sort of the power and the history of language, because at times, you know, let, let's redirect your language. And some students think, well, this is so PC, you know, well, like, why are we focusing so much on different ways of saying things or how to identify people? So I haven't done this exercise, but it, it made me think about it when I was thinking about this question. And there's so many people participating today. This is just so cool. So maybe give five seconds after I ask each question just to think. So think of all the derogatory and harmful words for a gay person. Going back in history, present, past. Now think about all the derogatory words for women. Now think about all the derogatory and harmful words for black people. And now think about all the derogatory and harmful words for people with disabilities. And now think about all the derogatory words for white, cis, hetero men. And when we think about that, so somebody did this exercise with me and it like blew my mind because there really aren't a lot of derogatory or harmful words for um, the power structure. And so this simple exercise really illustrates the, the power of language as a tool that really gets sharpened through the years and becomes a system of oppression and that language evolves over time. So in the question of person first language or identity first language, as some folks here might not know, a person first is, for example, I'm a person with a disability and identity first language is I'm a disabled person. So as practitioners and advocates, the idea is to be respectful to in language to those you represent, particularly um, if you do disability rights and justice. Um, however, there's been a movement away from saying, um, I'm writing about people with disabilities to I'm writing about disabled people or autistic people. Because by not centering disability, the idea is, you know, why are we pushing disability under the rug? Or why are we putting that identity under the rug? Is it something to be ashamed of? And so there was this, there's been this movement really driven by autistic people to say, my identity is first. I am an, I, I'm an autistic person, right? So even though person first language is designed to respect that there, there are two sides to how folks want to be identified. So as a practitioner and as my students, there's no right or wrong answer. You defer to the person that you're representing. And if, you know, as it comes up, or if you're writing a brief, or if you're talking to the court, you know, how would you prefer that I, I call you? How, how would you, you know, what, what is your preference? What would you like? And really you're empowering the client, you're empowering the person to let you know, and they're gonna be driving the show. So mistakes are made all the time in class, myself making them included. And so just by example, a student might, um, you know, use a phrase handicapped or use another phrase that really is outdated. And every time I, I, I know as a professor, I'm here, I need to re-correct re this language and use it as a teaching moment. I get so nervous. Like my whole body gets really hot. <laughs> and I'm like, and, it, and it's, it has to be done in the right moment or it's over. <laughs> you know, you can't like wait. And so what I do is I let the student finish the thought and I say, um, I just want to redirect the language that you are using to this, to this, because, and just, give a quick explanation and move on. And so that's more language that's used that um, is derogatory, which perhaps changed over time that students you know, haven't been exposed to or aren't aware of. So it's a little bit easier. Um, but we talked about language at the very beginning of the semester as like a living, breathing, evolving thing that has power. It has power to take away somebody's power, right? And it has power to harm. It also has power to give somebody the strength to, to, to to feel that they are in the driver's seat. So it, it's not just choosing what words to say. Um, so these are the, you know, the way I talked about it is more from a historical perspective, how language has changed over time. And that as advocates, we, you know, by recognizing that and respecting our client and understanding the power of our language and the power of oppression as it relates to language, it helps us um, be stronger advocates. I hope I answered at least one or, or two of those yeah. questions. <laughs> Good. That was great. It's very tricky 
when a situation comes up because on one hand, the students are there to learn um, and you want to give them some room to learn and grow. On the other hand, you don't want the thing that they said in a wrong way to hurt another student or your client. Um, and so there's this sort of balancing act where it's not going to help if you shame someone. However, <coughs> it also might not help if you just let it sit there and don't correct it. And so I, I, as you were describing your feelings, I know exactly what you're saying and feel like I, I have the feels too. Um, my next I just want to question- quickly add, I'm just real quick, that for professors to, to- you know, gently redirect students' language. Other, other students are, are so appreciative. I can't tell you how many times after class um, I've had students say, you know, I've had, I've been in law school three years and I've never had a professor actually like kind of call out. And I don't think it was in a negative way, but, um, and, and redirect language. And I just want to say thank you that I'm really grateful. So it really impacts not just, and I think you're right, Nicole, you don't want to put the student who's using the language in a space of feeling thrown under the bus and so it's really artful. Yeah, it's, there's no, it's very, you know, there, there are different ways to do it and you do your, you do your best. Thanks. I want to follow up uh, in sort of the same vein. What advice do you have to professors who make mistakes with terminology in a classroom setting? Is this for me? Okay. Um, like the professor themselves is making the mistake. Yes. Oh, I just call ourselves out immediately. I've done this before. I've made faux pas. I've made mistakes. And I, and I just call myself out and say that we're, you know, and, and then I reinforce that, you know, we're always learning in this learned environment. I don't know to what extent I've made a mistake that could harm a student. It's more like with language. So I haven't been in that position itself, but I certainly have used language. Um, maybe that was, could have been better expressed or was the wrong term, or I made assumptions in my language and I do my best to call my, my and I think one, one, students see the professor calling themselves out and being human about mistakes, it also sends a message, right? It starts from the top. It kind of sends the message to the whole class that it's okay, you know, um, we're, we're learning together on this and becoming better because of it. Thanks. Um, and now I'm gonna bring Eden into the conversation. Eden is a current Roger Williams University School of Law student class of 2023, almost done her journey with us. Um, Eden has spent a significant amount of time in law school advocating on behalf of diverse students. Eden is passionate about diversity and inclusion and serves on the DEI steering committee, as well as the LGBTQ plus subcommittee at the law school. I'm grateful for you being here so we can learn more from a student perspective. Can you talk a bit about when professors make a mistake from the point of view of a student? And specifically, can you share any advice for us about how you have seen professors successfully handle a mistake with pronouns or with terminology. Yeah, of course. So something that's not in my bio that probably will give a little context to this question. I'm an openly transgender student. So I, in preparation for this, spoke to other um, transgender students and just members of the transgender and gender nonconforming community um, to kind of put together essentially like four points for this for professors. Um, so point one, if you're a professor, don't freak out. If you've made the mistake, don't panic. Because if you panic, you're going to start going into this grand apology and you're going to put so much more focus on the student and the student is going to want to disappear in that moment. So step one is don't panic. Mistakes happen. And you just have to breathe for a second and process because if you don't do that, you're going to make it so much more like worse for the student than what you might have not intentionally meant to make it in the first place. Uh, step two, kind of like everyone else has been saying, quickly correct whatever the mistake was. So if you use the wrong pronouns or you use the wrong name, if you quickly correct it and do a quick apology and just say, oh, I apologize, I know that your name is this or your pronouns are this, and then just continue forward, that is so much better for the student because you're addressing it in the moment, but you're trying to minimize how quickly, how grand of an error it is in front of the rest of the class. And number three, give the student a little grace on whatever question it was that you were asking them about, because if you're cold calling them 
and you're asking them about some sort of holding of a case and this happens, they're probably not going to be able to think about the holding of the case right in that moment. They're going to be thinking about other things. So give them a little grace and a moment to answer. And if they're a little flustered, just keep it moving. Don't let people continue to look at the student because they, again, are just going to want to kind of sink away in the corner. Um, and then finally, make sure that you apologize afterwards. So whether it be something after class, you just pull them aside really quick to talk to them, send them an email. I don't remember who it was, but someone said that you have all the time after class to apologize and talk to them. That's something that goes a very long way with addressing these issues. So if you take the time to actually reach out to the student, do the formal apology, don't do it in the public setting of the classroom, it goes a lot further that way. Thanks, Eden. Um I don't mean to hog the student perspective, which isn't mine anymore, but the thing I would say is don't be defensive. Like our initial knee-jerk reaction, even if we've done the wrong thing, is to explain why we've done the wrong thing. And like, for me, it's like fight with all you can to not be defensive in this space. Okay, uh, my next question is for Natalie and Dylan. Um, moving from accidental mistakes to overt, overt use of objectionable words and phrases. At the last session, we got quite a few questions from faculty about how professors do and should handle cases, laws, or historical material which uses offensive language. Should you choose not to use the language with offensive, should you choose not to use the material with offensive language or topics? Should you read the material, have students read them in class, directly as written, edited in some way? Do you address this at the beginning of the semester? Uh, I just wanted to hear your both of your thoughts on how this issue should be treated. I'll start with Dylan. Oh, well, thank you, Nicole. Um, I guess first I wanna say, it. I mean, it, in my opinion, it is really unnecessary to use offensive language in class as part of the class discussion and how we as professors are preparing our materials. What I do think is a bit more challenging is when there's potentially offensive language in the source of law, when it's an opinion that's really old that we're teaching from or a statute that is still really um, operative, but it uses a, um, an obsolete word. And I think as professors, our job is to come to class prepared and as I believe it was Carmia who said it earlier, acknowledge that that word might have to come up if we're looking at the case or the statute. But it's within our abilities to steer the conversation in a way that doesn't use the offensive language, but we can still use the information to either have an opportunity to teach the student not just the law, but the context within the, in which the law came into being um and why we don't use that word anymore because we've evolved to a point where that word now has uh acknowledged negative connotations and so i think it just you know it it becomes a challenge when the word is in the source of law but as professors that's just part of our job and coming to class prepared and i would recommend acknowledging it will go a long way with the students who would maybe be upset at that word or those words being used in class Thanks, Natalie. Do uh, thanks. Period. Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have a lot to add. I think that's exactly on point what Dylan said. Um, and also, I think in addition to language, it could be concepts in that case that relate to language or things of that nature. Sometimes I put content warnings um, with my syllabus to kind of let students know, um, you know, that there's some there's there's some material that might some might find you know I find different language that works for that particular assignment. Um, I, I agree that I don't think it's necessary to, of course, use the offensive language, the outdated language. But I think it's a richer conversation is talking about what's behind it, right? Every court case is driven by racism, bias, capitalism, um, and ableism. And so, if you have this language that we no longer use anymore, it informs the statute. You know, ableism. And when I say ableism, I teach this in my class and I just, a quick definition, I'm reading Lydia Brown's very short definition. It's a systemic 
institutional devaluing of bodies and minds deemed deviant, abnormal, defective, subhuman, and language is ableist, it can be ableist. So I think, you know, one strategy is if you assign these cases to statute, is to really talk about why it's important to think about the language and what was driving the opinion, what is driving the statute and how that has actually evolved or not, or evolved in different ways over time. Because I think that background isn't taught enough in law school to kind of help give context to the work that we're doing, especially just challenging um, these older cases, these older statutes. And I think that context really lends a lot of breadth to understanding the complexity and the political nature um, of, of the system that we have that we're all working in that's like a box. And I think the students want it. Um, I, I, I don't feel, the, feel that they are opposed to hearing it. I think once you get started on that, the students find that really enriching and rewarding um, to see how some of these, uh, to get some of the historical context and background on what they're learning and not just focusing on the holding of the case. Um, Carmia, my next question is for you. Language is constantly changing and we're getting older, or at least you're getting older. Um, we have gotten many questions about how professors can balance their job demands and area of expertise while staying current with language. Do you have any particular advice on readings, trainings, or other practices for faculty and administrators looking to make sure they're doing the work to keep current before they make a mistake, before they step into the classroom and it's fraught? Uh Yes and no, and I'll start with no. And the no is that you're gonna get it wrong. No is that you're out of date. No is that you, if you are 16 and a camp counselor, you are uncool to the 13 year olds. And I can guarantee you if you are a law professor, you are out of touch with the law students. And so when I was thinking about this, the issue of, of uh, vocabulary, I reached out to a former colleague who when we practiced together um, was, just out of law school and I was already approaching middle age and he was talking about the importance of an anti-racist organization. And I remember thinking, now that's a term I haven't used really, or hmm, like what is, and that was more than 15 years ago, but more than 15 years ago is when the language was fully in the classrooms, but certainly not in my ears. And I was just coming out of a law school setting. And so when I reached out to him, because he's now a clinician, his comment was, well, gosh, my students correct me. And I think we have to be open and ready for those corrections. I think when you mess up, you take the L and you take the correction, right? It's just, we have these tools, right? We are an adversarial system, right? Think about athletics, which is the exact parallel for an adversarial system. Well, what happens? There's a foul. It is called, it is acknowledged. I mean, the student doesn't get a foul shot, like an extra five points, but they do get the acknowledgement of, I made that mistake, right? What were, um, in Ralph's questions, what should I have said? How should I have called you? In the Romance languages, we introduce ourselves by saying, I call myself, right? Je m'appelle, me amo, right? In the United States, we just say, well, this is my name, but, 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 but we should listen to that structure, right? We love Latin so much in the law. The structure of I call myself matters. And I think that goes for uh, across, across the board. Um, I had the experience of approaching a professor because I'd received feedback in my capacity um, as an administrator, which is how I've been, existed in uh, all my law school spaces about terminology and when I approached the professor, I was met with a no, just won't do it. Um, and the, the, the logic was couched in a statutory reasoning, uh, but as the, the conversation progressed was very much of a, I don't, how do I balance um, academic freedom with these requests? And so I think for each instructor, there is that personal balance that they must take on of where does my academic freedom meet with these people to whom our institution owes a fiduciary duty um, to have the capacity to learn uninhibited. And so that is what happens 
when we pull someone out of the conversation, right? As Eden said earlier, that student can't answer because they are so pulled out of the game by the hard foul of whatever it is the instructor said. So if they cannot learn, then we aren't even, we are not carrying out our mission. Um, and, and I think as teachers, as people who are committed to, to the education of lawyers, of law students, uh, there has to be some consistent drive to, to safeguard that, that North Star of we want them to learn. Um, and is what I'm doing teaching them? Am I toughening them up so that they are better instructors? Or am I completely, am I possibly getting in the way? Um, I'll, I will also make a plug for the uh, terminology list on the Roger Williams site because it, it is, I think, nine pages that you all have posted that are, are so useful. And I think if you have a starting space, a starting point, that these are all terms that you should know and they can all change, but at least know these nine pages as a start, um, that is where I would direct someone. Um, and the, the last quick thing I'll say with respect to language and its capacity to trigger, I think we just have to make sure that we turn things in both directions. Um, in, the, the, in 2020, Sean Osei Owusu, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, wrote uh, a short piece in the ABA Law Journal uh, titled For Minority Students Learning the Law Can Be Intellectually Violent. And so I think it's just important that when we look at an issue or language and, and look at triggers as coming in one direction that we turn the legal doctrine on all sides and we think about the capacity for all parties to be impacted. Um, and I think that's my perspective as an inclusion person um, is how are, which way are things going? Who are we protecting and at whose expense? Thanks. Uh, I really liked what you said. I really like that quote. I tend to think of things in terms of trauma. And when I sort of get to the, but academic freedom part, I realize that that's real but academic freedom at the cost of traumatizing or re-traumatizing our students, when I'm balancing this, it, the answer is easy for me. And, but I realize that I'm, I'm one person, but I just think that if you're going to be using the academic freedom argument, can you at least consider the, the re-traumatization of our students as, as a real effect to some of your behavior in the classroom, whoever we are? Um, I actually want to ask a question from the chat, um, which is, um, what advice would you give law schools to distinguish between unintentional and intentional mistakes by faculty? In other words, when should they assume goodwill and mediate mistakes and or administrator penalties on a professor in a way that does not trammel free speech? Does anyone want to jump in on that? I'm not, my response is you're asking us to jump on a third rail. I think, I, I, I don't know how you can know someone's intent. I don't, if, if we are all from communities, if we are all concerned with relationships and educating our students, then I would hate to imagine that it is someone's intent to do harm. Um, and I don't know how, and, sort of the trier of, like who is the trier of fact and how does that person determine the intent? Sometimes the impact is so great that it has to be addressed from that perspective. And so I think that we can address collectively um, in most settings, right? This person is being harmed. I'm gonna need you to take your, um, you know, the proverbial weapon out of there. Um, out of their body uh, or I need you to stop doing this thing that is inhibiting this swath 
of the people to whom we owe a fiduciary duty. Uh, and let's, yeah. I don't know. I, don't know. I, would add, I would just add to that, absolutely. I'm just rereading the question. I think maybe, um, I think the person's asking here also, you, you read this already, but just to repeat. In other words, when should they assume goodwill and mediate mistakes and or administer penalties? Okay, oh, sorry. Distinguishing between unintentional and intentional mistakes. I think really intent and impact, just what Carmina is, say, Carmi, Carmi is saying, um, sometimes uh, the intent has to be put aside for a little bit because the impact is so great. And I think that's where the defensiveness in professors, you know, or in all of us as human beings comes in, right? Like our intent wasn't supposed to be so harmful, but this impact is real. And so I think this question, we have to step aside and, and put the goodwill somewhere else. You know, it's there, but then that impact, um, and that should really be the focus in these times. I mean, you know, I'm not an expert, but just in this conversation, there's so many different variables here because every situation is different. But I think putting the goodwill and the intent aside and focusing on the impact is probably the first place to start. And then you go from there to answer, to answer you know, to investigate and ask more questions. I mean, I, I do think that the emergence of DEI offices is that there is someone who can facilitate these issues, right? That it's not, it, it doesn't need to be in the paradigm that the person put in the chat of well, when do you punish them and when do you help them? Well, I guess the question is, well, why do we need to, why would we start there, right? I mean, I think the first rule is probably to always get more information. And so then it's how can, who, who and how can the institution be a resource for its instructors and its law students, right? The two sets of rock stars in the building, um, right? Assuming that you know, as, as administrators, we have sort of a, a roadie sound tech and lighting role uh, for, the, for the whole show that is a law school academic year. Um, and I think that's a really important role, right? We, that we have to foster the community that allows, that allows bad things to be managed. Thanks. I think, um, Ralph, if you want to jump in on that question, or we can go to your next question, which is right up the same alley about community. Um, one of the best sources for understanding what's going on in the school and how I can grow and change in my pedagogy is to get direct feedback from my colleagues about these issues. Um, at Roger Williams, we have something called the Friday Group. Um, and Ralph, you were there when it all started. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the Friday group and how engaging with other faculty and really having a community can be helpful in, mis in areas when you are making a mistake? Yeah, are we still doing the Friday group? Oh, that's awesome. Um, so uh, answer to that and also something that was mentioned earlier, it, it's, it's thinking about, you know, the, the, the question about when we have to go after a faculty member, et cetera. I think that that's a valid question. It's also prompting in me to think about the containers that we create within the classrooms, because that's sort of a reactive approach. It's just like this happened and now I need you to do something about it. Versus if we really embody inclusion and belonging as a value of an institution, it's like form follows function. You have to see how your classrooms are set up and what ways you build in dialogue and facilitation and being able to name things to professors and classmates, et cetera, safely, so that it doesn't have to get escalated all the way to that other end of it. So it's, it, if you, it form follows function. If we have classrooms set up the same way that we always do, um, we'll see the same outcomes. But if you are really embodying the values of inclusion and belonging, then you have to think about everything from the, from the beginning differently because otherwise you're gonna keep getting the same outputs, if that makes sense. So the Friday group leaning into that was this wonderful space that came, you know, unfortunately from the pandemic. And it was also in response to the outcry for justice during the red hot summer of 2020. Um, concurrently happening with that um, on the national stage, there was a lot of stuff happening on our campus as well. There were students who were being harassed by local police, 
claims of housing discrimination. And you know, just like it was named at the beginning of the hour with our land and labor acknowledgement, there was a long history of white supremacy and slavery in the town of Bristol. And that ha that's past tense, but that has modern day implications. So there was a group of faculty members that had had enough and wanted to create a space to do better by our students and by our law school. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I'm taking no credit for it because I believe it was Debbie Gonzalez who created that. She's the associate professor and the director of our immigration law clinic. And Lori Barron, who is the director of clinical externships and the Feinstein Center for Pro Bono. Um, essentially, they sent out this school, law school wide invitation for faculty to join in an open, authentic, vulnerable conversation about how to better serve um, and live towards our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at the law school. These were good meetings and they were difficult meetings. What was good about them? Good, it, it was an opportunity for all faculty to come together um, along with me as the director of diversity and outreach. Um, I wasn't a professor, but I got to sort of sit in with the professors. And it was an opportunity to ask, troubleshoot, discuss challenges happening in the classroom and in the law school community. Um, another plus, it served as a really great think tank for our faculty to talk out and work through problems together collectively. I, I, I think there is value in having DEI leads within organizations and especially within law schools. I don't think that the work solely resides on that person. So I love the fact that this space was a way for folks across the board to think and problem solve together. Um, it also served as a safe space for team members to come together when things were happening on the national stage. So while this was all going on, there were shootings, horrible things, the storming of the Capitol, and it was a great place for folks to come together, process, and support each other. So those were all the pluses. Some of the challenges from what I remember, it became a very heavy lift for the folks of color on the call. And a lot of the conversations centered on racial tensions. And I remember some weeks not having the space to even be on the calls because it was heavy. And some of the weeks felt like ask a black dude what to do, and which, you know, what was awesome, though, is that I felt pressured or shamed when I didn't attend. And I think folks got it. And, and they understood truly some of the best people I have ever worked with who I miss a whole damn lot. Uh, other challenges, something that was noticeable was that this was a predominantly white space. And I guess a side effect of this meeting was the acknowledgement that we needed to do better with faculty hiring and retention of faculty of color. So it was sort of a, it was a prompt for us to say, oh, look at the faces in the room and maybe we need to think about this a little bit differently. Lastly, it, unintentionally created an us versus them space. And as I shared at the beginning, it, this invitation went out to all faculty members. And you best believe not all faculty members were there. Most of them, which is great, but the folks that needed to be there magically never showed up. And that's not new. This is like age old DEI challenges of preaching to the choir and how do you encourage other folks to show up and listen and understand. And yet, the few faculty who didn't attend these meetings would almost weaponize the gatherings with zero context about what we were gathering about. And it was used as fodder in faculty meetings. It, it was sad. The, the good news, it was very few people. The, sadly, though, like the, those few voices yielded a lot of power or perceived power within faculty senate and tenure and other spaces. It got ugly when it didn't have to. Um, it was really just an open, authentic, vulnerable, safe space. Um, and I think so many people would have been better served if folks had just shown up and talked and listened. So I, I'm glad to hear that the group is still meeting. And I know that a lot of actual action items regarding our faculty from hiring to courses to curriculum to, you know, even how we engage students in the classroom, those were direct results of conversations that happened in that very safe, vulnerable, invaluable space. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, yeah, the Friday group still happens and it's amazing. Um, and I can't say that it's not, that the conversations aren't difficult. I can't say we don't sometimes have conversations um, that, uh, that, that are repeated because some of the same issues persist, but I can say it's this, this amazing growing learning space 
where we can come with who we really are and our full selves and grow and learn from that. Um, just to answer a question in the chat, do we use a facilitator with the Friday group or talk about best practices? Um, or was it an opportunity for the group or was the group an opportunity for the faculty share experiences happening in the classroom? Um, we do not have a facilitator. We It was organic that this happened. And so right now we're changing facilitators every month. So we sort of, everybody volunteers to do a month or a few weeks at a time and we switch that way. Um, we don't have a community agreement. Um, and um, there is an opportunity to share what you're doing. There's also an opportunity to talk about, hey, what went wrong this week? Or we might have like a team conversation. Somebody will send out an article about like growth mindset and we'll spend an hour and a half talking about, you know, how did this article hit us? What do we think we need to do at the school? Um, if you have specific questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I also would say that uh, a plug for Vermont law. Um, so me and one of my coworkers and co-editors on um, the book, Integrating Doctrine and Diversity, Suzanne Harrington Steppen, we went to Vermont Law last year and talked about the Friday group, and they came up with like a model for their own version of the Friday group. Um, I believe they do have a community agreement. I believe their meeting schedule is they meet once a month and they do it over lunchtime, but the same sort of uh, idea it has taken hold and it really is like this great community of the willing where we're all there together. Um, and um, I know that we're running out of time, but this is a great question I'd love someone to weigh in on, which is, would you say that faculty of color and other minority faculty have to develop specific strategies to address mistakes in the classroom? I am thinking about the usual challenge of being seen as legitimate, knowledgeable and expert that we tend to face in classrooms. Um, for me, I've had to develop a combined approach of making sure I'm respected and still communicated openness to learn from students. Um, so uh, this came up in a previous in a previous broadcast. Um, and really, we talked about the issue of vulnerabil vulnerability and how our identity and the privilege that comes from our identity may impact the level of vulnerability we are able to have or feel we are able to have in the classroom. I think it's a really rich discussion, but if anyone on the call sort of really wanted to dig into whether people of color have to have a different approach or could have a different approach. I think it's worthy of a full conversation, like a full hour. I mean, it's worthy of a whole lot more. I'm just saying, if, since we have an hour, I, 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 I'd say that, it's, it's worth a dedication for that topic. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, it, there's a lot here to dig into. Thank you all. Um, uh, if uh, I want to especially thank our co-sponsors, the event planners behind the scenes that we don't really see, um, and our speakers who give their time. And when a random person emails them and says, hey, I think you'd be great to talk on this thing. Um, I just met Natalie today for the first day, for the first time. Um, I especially want to thank Eden, who's a student and is willing to bravely share her perspective. Um, and um, our next event in the speaker series is titled Integrating Content on American Indian Law and Indigenous Identities, and will be held on Wednesday, October 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern. So I hope to see you all there. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>